let's go ahead. Welcome to class tonight. We're back. We're back on board with good internet. Let's open a word of prayer. Okay, so um, welcome to Biblical Theology. Maybe you see a little bit different format. I, I'm changing my format. I think, I, I hope and pray that this format here will be more smooth. I'm not having to jump back and forth in screen sharing. I will, I will just do everything from my, from my iPad. So hopefully we have a smooth transition. Uh, just wanna thank those who, the, the, our, our partners, uh, Eastern Visaya School of Theology, Cebu Graduate School of Theology, and also Converge, both Converge US and Converge Philippines, as it's becoming known now, BCP. And so we're just excited for the future and this opportunity. I was talking with Jesus, and we are excited that we, we now see a vision of the future where we're no longer limited from networking together. So this internet thing is just going to grow. And we really want to see uh, these two institutions really take off um, for, for God's glory, not for ourselves. Uh, okay, so welcome to session number 13. We are almost done. If you look at our syllabus, we have fallen short. <laughs> we have fallen short. And uh, I made the executive decision that it's better for us to go slow and just to get a little bit versus try to rush to the end and just fa fail. So what we'll probably do is we'll probably have a, a second course on so biblical theology too, whether it's with CGST or just with EVST, everyone who's taken this course is more than welcome to, to attend it. And so what we're our plan now is, you know, maybe this is even changing from that the, the, the requirement sheet that I sent out. We're gonna really just take our time and finish the mosaic era because there's so much information. And I, I admit Voss is a very hard read. Um, and so we're gonna work through it together. And then we'll offer maybe biblical theology too in the fall to continue our, our study. And, um, and really, although Voss is a hard read, he is the foundation for everything that follows. So all these great works of biblical theology, he is, he is the founder. And I hope from your reading in the Mosaic era, you saw even comments like from, from others, uh, dwelling place of God that G.K. Beale really highlights. He's just, he's expanding upon Voss's work. So, um, so we're on to part number three, part three, just a quick overview of the se session. So after we overview the session, we will review our calendar. So we have some events coming up. We will be finishing this uh, semester soon. We will review our assignments. So I do want to go over the assignments that I posted, just uh, the requirement sheets so you can see that. We'll, we'll review that. Then we will have a breakout session discussion so you can discuss the homework uh, it was due today. I didn't really receive a lot of assignments come in. You know, I understand we're still, we're adjusting, we're making it through, but I do want you to work through them, at least so you're aware of the issues and you're able to, to um, interact as we work, as we work through uh, the, the notes and then also the text tonight. And then we'll, we'll work through the course notes. And then in the course notes, we also will unpack scripture and then we'll have a conclusion and prayer. And so with that, uh, C, uh, CGST, EVST calendar. So this is not everything in the calendar. This is just concerning our, our class. Uh, so May 7th, if you are graduating, I believe there's only one student in this class that's graduating. If you're graduating CGST, you have to have all your, we have to have your assignments done by May 7th. So the one student I've already spoken to, we're, we're gonna meet together uh, to work through that, but you know who you are. Uh, next, the last week, the last week of, of class class ends may 14th so it's coming up really quick so tonight we're going to go over the assignments we'll go over the project and and so even though may 14th is the last week of class we, there is another two weeks of extension to get your work in so we will work to help you to get your assignments in so uh may 14th is the last week of of our physical meeting, okay, as far as new content. We, we can meet after that to help you. May 26th, everything is due, okay? So everything for this class is due, um, May 26th. I say sudden death, but then I give mercy. So, <laughs> you know, maybe it's like almost uh, just do, the, do your best, okay? It's not, it's not a true uh, sudden death. <laughs> One day it will be. Uh, and then June, so in June, we originally were going to have new, a new course start. We're going to take a pause. All of the month of June is going to be catching up. 
what we want to do is we want to go over you were turning in assignments for bible's big story also for hermeneutics some people did not finish uh, um i want to give a chance or even this semester too with with um uh biblical theology redefining leadership i want to give everyone a chance for those who want to finish with credit the month of june is going to be catching up and finishing so I have to grade, I, I have backlog of grades from, from the first semester. Uh, there are some assignments that will be due. So all of the month of June will be catching up. So we will work to get all the assignments done, graded. You will have an official uh, description of what you did and then also your grades. So we are going to, um, it's gonna be official. It's gonna be good. You're gonna like it. So month of June is catch up. So nothing new will be scheduled. We, we will probably be, be meeting once a week to discuss, to work with you. Pastor Henry mentioned, are, is this still on to maybe meet on a weekend in Babatnon for fellowship for a day or a, a, overnight? Is, 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 is there a plan for that, Hen Pastor Henry? I love about that. Ah, good, okay, yes, okay, we're, we're there. Good, excellent, go okay. ahead. We can have, we can have in Babatnon uh, for compliance, uh, for especially for this June assignment. To catch up all those uh, courses of who has taken the hermeneutics, Bible, big story, we can have. So maybe we could have like a weekend or overnight where we just all go there. Like you can work on your assignments. We can like something like that. Yeah, even even our classmates in Cebu, if they can come. Okay, Siggy, Siggy. All right, so we'll make a plan. No pressure, no pressure. But if, if we'll have some type of meeting together. We're going to get everything caught up. I also want to load up the other, not all the videos were loaded from Christianity 101 and Bible's Big Story. So there's just a lot of catching up to do. I don't want to start any new work until we get caught up um, with, with um, completing what we already have to do. Uh, this is, uh, we, we, we've been adjusting to COVID and also to online. And so I just, I think a pause and a catch up is, is really is really is really good for us. Okay, um, so we can discuss that later. That's all I'm going to say. Okay, before we get to the notes, I want to share with you. Um, so I posted this. I posted two. Well, I posted all of these documents um, on the Google Drive. So just review here. Um, sessions 13, 14, and 15 are just going to be continuing in uh, mosaic period. So this is not new content. We, I will change that. But what we will have is we will have essentially 15 sessions on YouTube. If you've attended all the sessions, you can just, you're already done. But for those that maybe missed a week or you could not attend, you can watch the rest of the sessions to get caught up. And then this is all of the, these are all of the assignments that need to be submitted, okay? These are all the assignments that need, need to be submitted. SR7 and 8 is going to be related. SR7 I already posted. SR8 will also be related to Mosaic Era. So that, that's two changes I'll, I'll make changes on. But, but essentially, these are, all, these are all of the assignments that will be due. The reading reflection, if you notice here, I, I, do, I do want you to read uh, number nine, and also number 10. So for those of you who have not submitted nine and 10, you do need to read for CGST specifically, I'm thinking, because that's part of the assignment. So if you're enrolled in CGST, you need to complete that. Um, and then reading report 11 is the book of Theophany. So you need to read the book of Theophany and, pre and prepare a book report. That's posted and it has the description of how to do it. So it's very easy, it's straightforward, just follow what was posted and, and shared there. And notice that it's not, notice the date here. So the date is um, 526. So you have time to, to do that. Uh, I hope that you've been reading uh, during the semester, even if we don't have class, but um, you still have over a month, actually one month today, one month today to, to, to complete that, okay? Group project is a theme trace. We'll go over that in a second. Um, that's due the 26. I'll explain. I'll give details just in, in a moment. And then also there is the, the final exam. So everyone, whether you are BT 101 or TH 615 or BT 501, we're going to have a final exam. The final exam is going to cover the same content from the midterm and then also a, a, some new things from Mosaic Era. So you will have a second chance 
to answer the same questions. Okay. So I won't put all of this, I won't put all of them down, but I'll choose some questions for you to answer. We'll also have a workshop on how to study. And so I want you to try again to, to, to answer the questions. I made comments, so you should have been able to see my comments. Uh, I also shared the PowerPoint. So everyone should be better on the final than the midterm, okay? So I'm expecting you to do a lot better and, and you're, you'll be asking, I'll be asking you the same questions, okay? So um, we'll have a, a, a review to go over how to prepare for the final exam, okay? Let's go now to, um, for BT 101. I posted this, it's going, it's, it's very similar. It's very similar, but if you notice the, the reading report I already changed. It's just going to be theophany. So you have to do the readings, but there's no report. You're just going to fill out, I, I read such and such. I completed the reading, lost point, part one, chapter one, okay? There's no reflection, um, actual like answering questions, okay? Um, uh, and then just follow the, the scripture reflection reports as I, as I posted, submit those. And then the same thing, you have a theme trace that's due at the end of this month, and then the final exam, okay, the final exam, all right? Um, and this is posted. So um, at this time, any questions or comments from either two, we can jump back and forth. Any questions or comments from either two of these, um, these uh, uh, documents? Okay. Um, the next thing I want to go over just briefly is, is the... Uh, is the project. Here's the project. And so I'm, I want you to read through this um, on your own time. You do not need to choose the theme because I've chosen the theme for you. And, and you'll see that in the next, uh, the next page. The same thing with number two, looking at the Hebrew and Greek words, I, you know, expanding your search. You don't have to do that. I've left the instructions there, so that if you want to do a, if you wanted to do a, a search for another trace another theme through scripture from a biblical theological perspective, okay. So one, two, and three are essentially really chosen for you already. And so what you're going to do is you're going to pick pick one book of the Bible, and you're going to search for this for this theme. So we, we've chosen Revelation. You'll see that on the next page, but you're you're going to search through that. Um, and then you're going to record the citations that you find in a timeline document. And then after you look at that, you're going to talk to your other classmates because everyone's going to choose different books of the Bible. You're going to compare what you find, and then you're going to have a summary section. Okay, so you're looking at the surrounding context for each citation and how the theme is developed in the entirety of Scripture. Okay, so. So let's look here. The example, the example that I gave was Revelation. So you're 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 looking through for the the concept Revelation. Uh, perhaps that really should be special Revelation because we're not doing natural Revelation, but it's kind of implied um, in that God is the one revealing. So the key words. Look at the key words here. So I gave you a pretty good range of key words. There could be more than this. But at least this is the minimum. So you're looking for ideas like word of God, uh, God speaking. So God says, the Lord says, okay. Um, it could be the prophet. The prophet says, thus says the Lord. So that would be a reference to what is to follow. The presence of a prophet, the pro presence of an angel, the, the, the word reveal, prophesy, um, show, message, command dream. So these are all, when you see these words, and, and it's in the context of God speaking or commands of God or for uh, special revelation from God, the, the concept is being brought into the foreground, okay? So the books of the Bible that you can choose from are Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, Isaiah 40 to 66 only, Matthew, you can actually include John here as well. So um, you can include the Gospel of John, Romans, Hebrews, and Revelation. Okay, so what I will do is I will allow you to work together 
you can work amongst yourselves. So CGST, um, Master of Arts in Theology, I had a brain freeze. So whether it's you're a CGST student or EBSC student, everyone needs to choose a different book of the Bible. So what, what you're going to do is pick a book and then post on in our group, not the, not the, the message chat, but in the group, the book that you're going to be searching, okay? Everyone should choose a different book, okay? And then you're going to, once you do the search, you're going to come together as a class and discuss what you found, okay? Is everyone tracking there? Does that make sense what we're doing here? This should not be hard. This should not be hard. So you're gonna choose one book. And so I don't want everyone doing the same. So once you post, you kind of have that locked in. So you might wanna post quick if you wanna, if you wanna pick, if you want to put, pick one of these. Now, I do want to say, don't feel if someone picked a book before you, I promise you, whatever book you choose, it's going to be fun, okay? So don't worry about if you don't get the, the, the choice that you want, you're going to enjoy it, it's going to be fun, and you're interacting with, they will share, each one should be, everyone should be sharing your results, okay? So, so don't feel bad if you don't get the book that you want, I promise you. I've done it for the most part in all of these and there's a lot of information to be shared. Okay, so <laughs> don't worry about that, okay? You're, I am looking for 100 references, okay? So 100 references for this theme. So uh, look down an example here, okay? So everyone can see this example here. So for example, I did just Hebrews, okay? So whoever chooses Hebrews, I gave you three. Um, number one, so you're literally going to do this. I don't want you to copy and paste. I want you to type. I want you to type it out. So Hebrews 1, 2, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, by a son, okay? There actually could have been four here because by a son would also be included. <laughs> so there you go, okay? But you're going to highlight in red the references, God spoke by the prophets, he has spoken, and then by his son. So there's really four times there, okay? And then number two, Hebrews 1, 5, to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son today, I have the gospel, okay? So right there, there's four references, okay? I'm looking for a hundred of these, okay? Is everyone is, is everyone tracking with me? So, so then just for clarification, are we going to choose a biblical theme or only... No, you're, only or I've chosen the theme for you. So just to make it easy, just to make it easy, because you'll never see the connections if everyone chooses a different theme. And then to look at all the scripture with one, it's just too much work. Originally, I wanted to do that, but yeah, it's, we will only have one month. So, so you're all working together as a team. So I want you to work together as a team on Sunday nights. If you want to get together, we can do the Zoom call. You can share your information, what you've learned. And so all your... The first part of the project is just to do a timeline recording like this. You're just going to go one to whatever it is. Maybe you have 50 references because a, a passage could have two or three references, okay? Um, uh, uh, but if you notice here, you can't say God and spoke as two. It's God spoke as one, okay? By the prophets is one. He has spoken one by his son, two. So there's four there, okay? So it's not really 100 verses. Um, maybe maybe it would be somewhere between 50 and 100 that you'll end up getting. And then you're going to compare all the different references. You're going to look at, so someone's going to do Gospel of John, someone's going to do Romans, and someone's going to do Genesis, and you're going to, you're going to compare and compile all your information. Lastly, so that's the first part. And then lastly, two to four pages, I'm not looking, I'm not looking for a, a thesis. I'm not looking for all these minuscule things. I just want a two to four page analysis and summary. So all you're going to do is just, you can, you can have an introduction paragraph. You can have two paragraphs, three paragraphs describing what you saw in your book. And then one or two paragraphs comparing it with what your, your classmates shared with you. And then just a summary con concluding paragraph, okay? It's not, it's not a research paper. You know, I don't want commentary, okay? I don't want commentary on each <laughs> verse, okay? I just want you to look at the big picture and say, uh, this is how God's revelation has been unfolded to us, okay? Um, so it's not that two to four page analysis 
by the time you're done and talking with anyone, you're literally just typing down your thoughts. It's, it's not hard at all. I'm not, I'm, it's, it's not going to be hard. You're, you're, you'll really know what to say there. It won't be hard. You, you'll, you'll see it yourself. A any questions or comments? Is that making sense? Okay, and that's it. So you just have to finish the, the reading reflection reports. The, the scripture reading, there's only two more left. There's one that's due tonight and then one more due. That's it. Um, and then the final exam will essentially be the midterm with, with a couple, uh, couple more questions from Mosaic Era. So again, you know, you get a second shot. You get a second shot. And if, and if you do a lot better than on the first, I'll even take that into consideration to, to, to boosting your grade. Okay, so... Um, I, I'm, I'm for you. I'm not against you. I want, you know, some teachers have the philosophy, you know, there's a bell curve. There's like two A's, two F's, and then most gets B's and C's. I'm not, if you put the work in, I'm totally happy with most, most people getting A's. Okay. So, um, submit your work, you know, um, finish, finish strong. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? Okay, um, we will. I will post this so that hopefully by the end of the week, so you'll still have, you'll be able to, 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 to review this when you're working together. For those of you who just entered, this is just describing, uh, I think Clearable Boy, we're just going over the project where everyone's working together on the project. So you can watch that video just whatever this week. And then you can work together on like Sunday night discussing your the data that you find and then you just have a brief summary describing what you found. So it's not stressful. It's not, you don't have to choose your theme. I've chosen it for you. Just choose one book in the Bible and you're looking for a hundred references, okay? If perchance you really looked at your scripture and there was not a hundred references, I really don't think there is. I think everyone will have it, but let's say perchance there isn't. Then you could pick another book in the Bible and just find the balance, okay? So I don't want, I don't want more than 100 references, okay? So if you were to find 200 references, there's no bonus to you, okay? I just, the point of the project is to, is to give you enough interaction with the text so that you can see the theme in your book. You share it with your classmates, and then you look at the big picture, and then you just give me the conclusions. That's, that's it, okay? I'm not, I'm not looking for 500 or 600, okay? So it's really, that's the design here. Okay. okay, so now we're, we're going into the, uh, the breakout room. So we're going to do a breakout room now. Um, uh, does everyone have at least, I know that maybe some of you have not submitted your, your scripture reading reflection report. Does everyone have though the questions and the texts? Everyone has that, correct? So what I want to do is I'm going to, group, I'm going to break you into groups and each group is going to have a passage of scripture. So let me divide. Let me stop share right now. Group number one, that's Jesus, Chalmer, and Sonny. So the passage you're going to be looking at will be, I want you to look at, I want you to look at Matthew 5, 17 to 48. That's a lot, but we're really focusing on Matthew 5, 17 to 20, okay? Uh, 21 to 48, that's really minor. Don't really spend, if you have extra time, do it, but, and, and use it at, Consult with it as you're making your decisions with Matthew 5, 17 to 20. But the focus is really on Matthew 5, 17 to 20, but consult the rest. So you're doing Matthew 5, 17 to 48, and also Mark 12, 28 to 34. Group number two is Danny and Henry, and it will be, I think we lost Shoni. Shoni will come back. So it'll be Danny, Henry, and uh, Ati Shoni. You will have Romans 2. Uh, 14 to 16, and also Romans 13, 8 to 14. So I added a passage there. Um, Romans uh, 2, 14 to 16, and Romans 13, 8 to 14, okay? Group number three, you will have James 2, 8 to 13, Ephesians 6, 1 to 4, okay? We will not look at 1 Timothy 1, 3 to 11. We, we just probably won't have time to interact with that passage Um but that's it. So everyone's going to have two passages. So answer those questions. Uh, answer those questions, okay? Any questions or comments, or does that make sense? We don't have a lot of time because we have a lot in the PowerPoint, and we're going to work through each tech, text by itself. 
So I just want you to briefly answer the question. Um, don't feel bad if maybe later it's clarified or maybe you change your perspective. This is a learning experience. So men have changed their minds on this. Men have debated this issue for so many years. So, you know, I, I, in one sense, I don't want to be hard and fast because it is a very debated issue. At the second, and in the second uh, way, I do, there is, it should be clear. So there are, there should be some clarity and there should also be some um, uh, uh, room to, to disagree. So let's just go through here really quick. I'm going to write down each passage of scripture. Just briefly give me your answers. And then we're going to look at the PowerPoint and what boss says that we're going to go to the text. And I hope that this really brings things into clarity for you. Um, so we're looking at group number one. So I'm going to write down uh, Mark verses, uh, chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. So Mark 28, 12, 28 to 34, number, uh, question number one. So I'm not going to write down the question. I'm just going to write down the answer. Uh, so group number one, who is the speaker? Jesus. So Jesus is the speaker. Number two, who is the audience? The scribes and people who surround them. <clears throat> so, 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 so we have to look at two issues, right? We need to look at the context of Jesus and also the context of Mark. So maybe there's a little bit of a trick question there. So uh, concerning the audience, who, who is the immediate audience in uh, Mark 12, 20 to 34? Teacher of the law. Okay, teacher of the law. Some people say lawyer, teacher of the law. Anyone else we want to add to this? Okay, we'll leave it there. Yeah, so so let's let's leave it there and then maybe we'll we'll discuss it. So if that's your if that's your answer, that's fine. I don't want you to try to answer it now. So that's fine. We can at least say teacher of the law. Number number three. What are the commands? A quotation from Deuteronomy chapter chapter. Chapter 6, 4, love the Lord your God. So this is a quotation. And what is what is that? Come on, I want to I want a strong. What is it? The the great Shema, right? The great Shema. Uh, with, with the word, yeah, with the word, with with, with some uh, a word that Jesus put. Uh, he put the word mine just to emphasize. Uh, okay, but but yeah, but but so we could we that that's a, a tangential issue. That's a tangential issue. Essentially, he's quoting the Great Shema, right? So the, he says the first, the greatest commandment. So there, the, it, it, we could we could discuss in a technical class the reasons there, but we would at least say that this is the Great Shema. Um, and then uh, what else? What else? So we have the Great Shema, and then what else? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So that's coming from Leviticus what? Where is that coming from? Leviticus? 1918. Uh, what was that? 1918. 1918. And this 19, is the, the second commandment, right? Number four. Are those commandments abrogated, fulfilled? Or still in effect. Fulfilled. Uh, at this point, this is this is fulfilled. It's fulfilled. So the, the command is no longer binding. Yes, the command is no longer binding, but it fulfills in, in, in Jesus Christ. In, in that context, that you would have to say that's an interpretation, Diva. I mean, what are the two greatest commandments? Where are you getting the fulfilled part? Okay, Singy, we'll leave it. We'll we'll, we'll look at that. So it's no longer it's it's no longer binding. It's no longer in effect for us to be following. That's what binding means. Binding means is it's still commanded. It's still the command is still uh, carrying weight. So let, let's 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 okay. So let let's be specific here. Okay. So to be clear. Okay. So let's let's get. I, I wanna I wanna be clear here. I don't want to be confusing. So when we say abrogated. 
This means to nullify, okay? So for example, Congress can nullify a law, correct? Jump in if you want to, okay? So no, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, that's correct, that's correct. It means to, to, it means to do away. That is to say, no, no longer no binding. Yeah, no, no, long, no longer binding or effect. Okay, when we talk about fulfill, we're gonna look at, we're going to look at this word fulfill, but it seemed to me from your, because there's different nuances to fulfill, but it seemed to me by your statement, at least by your group, I'll say by your group, that means that Jesus completed this the requirement and it I, I'm as I, I'm defining it as you have given it to me. So maybe you want to clarify it. But because I asked, is it still in effect? And you said no. Is it binding? And you said no. So Jesus completed the requirement, the command, the command is to love God and to, to love others as yourself. And and then I said, well, is it still binding? And you said no. So it is no longer in effect no it's still binding thing okay so i'm not i'm just saying that's how the group one answered it so we'll discuss that okay so ray says it's still binding so maybe we'll have to come back to that okay and then when we say the question so i'm right now ray just i think some people jumped in right ray, ray came in we're, we're looking at this question concerning the relationship and we're asking um is the law the commandments are they abrogated done away with are they fulfilled are they still in effect so you could answer um it would be in many cases it'll be difficult to, to answer two or three but in, in a few cases from what i'm seeing in the context you could have possibly two answers but group one said that um it's 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 so when we say still in effect, we're saying it's still binding. Okay, so I want to be really clear here. So abrogate means to do away with. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, when it is, when you say it's still in effect, still binding, that means we are still bound to obey it. Yes, yes, we still have to, we're, it's still commanded for us to do. Okay, so, so it seems here that your, your answer was just to fulfill. Right? All you're saying is just one, correct? And then, so let's go now to, to Matthew. Matthew. Matthew 5, 17 to 48. Who is the, who is the, the speaker? No, Jesus. Sir. Jesus. Number two. Uh, who is the audience? Um, disciples. His disciples. Okay. Any other audience possible? Uh, the, the crowd, because this is the month. Yeah. Sermon of the Mount. Correct. So we have and disciples, crowd. Okay, yeah. Anyone else? Jewish or is that, that's good. Yeah, so this would be a Jewish crowd. And then number three, what is in view here? What are, what are the commands? Just do a general. What, what are the commands in reference to? About anger. Yeah, basically refer, reference to anger, lust, the decalogue. divorce. The decalogue About, or the Ten Commandments. Some of the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Typical uh, Ten Commandments. So what we what we would say here is that this is this is um decalogue yeah and other parts Diba there's other parts correct Tama so so then we could generally say this this is referencing um the law but we would want to define it as the decalogue and also other parts or other commands right 
So basically, it's whole law, the, the whole law of, of Moses. Because both Decalogue, also, yeah, both Decalogue and other commandments outside the Decalogue, right? Okay. Yeah, we can say that because even Voss will just make those two distinguishes. Okay, number four. How did you how did you understand? Abrogated, fulfilled, still in effect. We we agreed a while ago, sir, to abrogated, sir. Abrogated. Yes. The, the decalogue, maybe the, uh, I think we are referring for the decalogue, some of the decalogues. I am correct, Sunny. Uh, the, the whole law, actually. The whole law is abrogated. Yes. That's, that's, what, uh... that's what we see it. Oh, <laughs> Okay, so we'll have to go there because, all right, Siggy, Siggy, Abrogate, okay, we'll discuss. Sani can explain, sir. Sani can explain why we have that uh, kind of stand. Okay, Sani, go. Well, no, well, wait, well, 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 it's okay. We'll just leave it here. So this is, law is abrogated, the, the, all, the whole law. Okay, Siggy, okay, whole. Okay, we'll come back there. We'll come back there. Siggy, okay. Again, no stress. We're just, we're looking at this. Um, Okay, uh, next, uh, Romans 13, I'm sorry, Romans 2, Romans 2, 14 to 16, Romans 2, 14 to 16. So this is what, this was additional text we're going to be looking at tonight. Uh, number one, who is the speaker? Group number two. In the speaker is Paul. Okay, the speaker. God, let's say, the speaker is Paul. Okay, that's, no, that's good. Paul, so it's the Apostle Paul. Who is the audience? Audience are the Gentiles, including the Jew. So, so the, the uh, Gentile, Jew, and, but let's let's be so. Let's be clear, though. Let's let's be clear, though. However, we see this specifically in what context? Gentile and Jew, Henry. The context of Romans, the the epistle. Hint, hint. The epistle. To the Romans. Here in for for us to understand, Paul was writing this to the Jew, letting them know that the Gentile who are not subject to the law, they themselves are observing the law or obeying the law. Yeah. No, that's good. That's good commentary on the on that immediate context. But the letter of Romans, Deba is written to who? Uh, to the Romans in, in, in to the Christian in Rome. The so what's so significant that we're going to unpack is that it's so Matt, Matthew and Mark, it could be debated, although we'll see perhaps the, the audience is also the church, right? Um, although the immediate context, you have the audience within the, the parts, and then you have the audience of the letter, the, the, the gospel. Here, you have the, the immediate that's being referred to, but then you have it's the church in Rome. Okay, number number three. What are the commands? Now, if it's very general, you're just going to give me general. What what, uh, what about number three? The command is it's the decalogue. Oh no! Uh, yeah, do not, yeah. Do not judge. It's the decalogue. Yeah. So so we're going to look at this. We could say the law, the law, and most likely in in Paul's mind, it is the decalogue. And we, that's maybe a little bit debated, but, but it's possible, okay? Number four, is it still in effect? <laughs> yes. It's, it's still, still binding. It's still binding. Okay, so your answer is still binding. So in some sense, it has to be still binding in order for someone to believe the gospel, Diva. Right? So we'll look at that. We'll look at that. Um, great. So you're saying it's in this context specifically, it's still in effect, okay? Um, Romans 13, 8 to 14. Uh, so we're, we're, you're going to say the same thing. I'll just scroll it in quick. It's Paul. Number two, it's the church. Number three, what's in view? What's in view? What's the commands in, in Ro, Romans uh, 13, verse 8 to 14? Henry, what are the commands? The command is, uh, these are found in the Decalogue. 
The second portion, right? The second half. The second correct? half is the Shema. Yeah, the second half of the Shema. You know, do not uh -huh. uh, murder or those things. And then um, how does it summarize? How does it summarize? Summarize into the greatest love. It's Love summarized Matthew 22, 39. Yeah, so, it's so, so now, Henry, is according to this, is it abrogated? Is it fulfilled? Is it still in effect? It's still in effect. It's still in effect. Okay. So now we have by by each group, I'm not trying to 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 pressure anyone but look here look look at the big look at the big uh issue here so can can these two stand does everyone see the issue here so in mark 12 28 to 34 it's fulfilled but not in effect and actually i think you said it's abrogated but i think there i'm thinking you're saying it's fulfilled but it's not in effect that's what group number one said here, group number, group number two said that it's still in effect. So it cannot be both. It cannot be both. So I, I hope that it cannot be both. So I hope it can't be both. Certain. Yeah. Yeah, it cannot be both. Certain. Um, if you are going to be both. At verse verse fifteen. Apostle Paul, um, actually, the, the verse you you given is until verse fourteen, but verse fifteen uh, tells us about this this law that is written in the heart of the Gentiles. Uh, these are not actually the, the law that was given to the, to Moses to the Israelites, but this is the law that is law of conscience that Apostle Paul is referring here. What well, well, so, so it's it hold, hold on, sorry, you're you're looking at Romans two right now. We're going to go there, okay? I'm referring yeah, so, to right now we're on Romans Romans 13. Okay, so we, we can come we can come back and discuss that. Okay. So we'll we'll come back and discuss that. But Romans Romans 13 is a group, group now. I'm not I'm not giving my stamp of approval. I'm not giving my stamp of approval yet. I'm I'm recording what your answers were. Okay. So Romans 13, 8 to 14. Group number two said it's still the law, the, the law is still in effect. Okay. Everyone tracking there with me? Everyone tracking yeah. there with group me? Group number three team, my group joke. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we're going to discuss the content. Okay. At this point, we're just summarizing your conclusions. Okay. Then we're going to investigate. Okay. So right now, everyone's stressed. Okay. <laughs> Relax. Okay. I, I, the, the, the purpose of this exercise is number one, to see that it's, it's debated, okay? I want us to see that's debated. Number two, I want us to see though, I want us to see that it is important, okay? It is important and I want us to set the table so that when we look at the text, when we look at the text, we can come away with some solid conclusions. And here's the thing, Mama Kapitid, I don't want anyone to hold their beliefs on their sleeve. Meaning to say, if, if you had an answer and then you want to change it, that's completely fine. Everyone in theology changes their answer, okay? There are some things that we don't change, and there are some things that we should be willing to adjust, okay? So no one should be, even myself, I've changed my position. I've changed my position different, different times on different issues. So, you know, the, the only thing preventing from us from growing and learning is our pride, <laughs> <laughs> prevent us from growing in our learning is our pride. So let's get to the last two questions and then we're going to get into the text, okay? Well, before we get into the text, we're going to look at Voss. We're going to set the table in Voss and then we're going to look at, at, at this, okay? So um, James chapter James chapter 2, verses 8 to 13, okay? So we're going to move quickly here. Group number three. Uh, the speaker is James himself. Okay. The audience is uh, the church. Uh, okay. Sorry, the, the Jews who are in uh, dispersion. But it's but it but it would have to be the Jew. I mean, it's in the context of the church. So, unless we're saying that 
that the, the, the letter of James is not written to the church. We could say Jewish Christians or the church, okay? Because we're using James in our context, right? So we're, we're, we're directly applying James's truths. So we, we could say the uh, Christian Jews in the church. Fair enough, fair enough. Number three, what view, what, what laws, what commandments are in view, Jomar? Uh, seventh commandment and six, six, seven. Yeah, six, seven commandment. So we could say the Decalogue's in view. Yes. Number four, is, is it still, <laughs> is it still binding? Meaning to say, is, is he still giving the command to the believers in this context is it still a command that we're to follow uh i believe i believe so oh, sorry okay so it's still so it's still binding yeah but the, i think the condition that uh james want to to uh this this uh, audience to comply is do not uh show partiality when yeah. they commit the uh, when they obey this this uh law yeah. do not show partiality yeah and uh, still abiding. Uh, yeah, but James are expecting this audience to observe these laws. I don't want to give my answer yet. I, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. D did you see it still as binding or not as binding? Or what? how did you see it? I, maybe I, I apologize. Um, how did you see it? Uh, still abiding. Still, still abiding, yeah. So, so that is to say, now let, let me be clear here, okay? As we work through these texts, what we're really dealing with is we're not dealing with, let's be clear here, the meaning in the foreground. So in each of these contexts, uh, whether it's Jesus, whether it's Paul, whether it's James, they're not teaching us this is what the law is, except in, some of them there are, some of them there aren't. This is more, um, they're giving practical commands and an application in their specific context, but, but certain truths have to be true as a presupposition, as a foundation, in order for their, uh, in order for their ex exhortatory context to stand, is everyone tracking there with me? So, in many ways, we're dealing with with conceptual truths that have to be true in the background, so that those practical commands can be given. Is, is everyone seeing there? So, we're not saying, for example, James is primarily teaching on the relationship of the Mosaic law, the Decalogue to the New Testament. He's dealing in a practical situation. And in the background though, something has to be true in order for the context to make sense. So everyone's tracking there with me. Um, okay, uh, lastly, Ephesians, yes. Ephesians 6, one to four. Tim, don't we need to explain our side why we chose it? Yeah, yeah so what's gonna happen, Ray, is that we will we will let you interact once we so what so this is the way it's going to work okay we're we're going to write down Ephesians six one to four then we're going to go into Voss and we're just going to read through the PowerPoint some of the things so you can really see what he's saying then we're going to look at the Decalogue and the the Great Shema make some significances then so even if we don't get to it tonight I hope we do. Uh, then we're going to look at these. So maybe we'll be late. Maybe we'll continue on. Maybe we'll finish. Okay, so that's really how we're going to do this. Okay, I, I just want us all to just slowly work through this so that we can see it. All right. So is that does that make sense, Ray? Yeah, yes, Tim. Yes, Tim. Okay. Thank all you. right. So let's move quick. Um, uh, go ahead. Um, Ephesians 6, 1 to 4. Okay. I will be the one to answer, Tim. Uh, he is not yet ready. Go ahead. Uh, the speaker is Paul okay. to the Ephesians. Probably this is our disciples or Christians in, in Ephesus. So we can say the church, Diba. Okay. Yeah. The church. The, the reason why Remember. I'm bringing that up is just because the whole debate is in the church versus in the, outside the church. That, that's why we're highlighting the fact that this is within the church. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Number three. Number three, the, the command is specific. Obey your parents, honor your mother. Okay. 
the command. I don't. Uh, what's the number in the third part of the Decalogue? Because that's part of the Ten Commandments or part of the Decalogue. But specific here is obey your parents. I, is it number five? Yeah. Correct me. Is it number yes. five? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I think yeah. I think that's that's the one. So this is fifth commandment. And then number four. Still binding? Yes. Still binding. Okay. All right. So we have the table set. Okay. We could go to First Timothy. We just don't have the time. If you wanted to, we could discuss that next week. We just don't have the time with, with everything going on. Um, okay. So uh, let's go ahead right now. First off, do you want to take a break or do you want to go? Do you want to take a break first? Okay. All right. Um, let's go ahead. Let, let's look at what... Let's look at the PowerPoint here of what Voss says. Okay, so we're looking at the PowerPoint PowerPoint for what Voss says, and then we're and then we will look at the Old Testament, some of the passages, and then we'll look at the New Testament. Okay, all right. So um, we'll just I'm just going to read some of the statements that he says. Then we're going to look look at the text. Okay, so number one, this is I'm kind of bringing us in from last week. Um, the video should be posted hopefully by tomorrow. If you missed last week, so you can you can catch up on that. Um, Voss says, says this, so this is part two, I guess, from, from last week. When on the other hand, the OT is taken as an entity by itself. So looking at the Old Testament as an entity by itself and is rounded off provisionally in itself and looked at as it were with the eyes of the Old T Testament itself, we find it necessary to take into account positive elements by which it prefigured and anticipated typically the New Testament. So Number one, I, I should have brought number one and two. I forgot to bring it in. Number one was saying when you when you look at the Old Testament compared to the New Testament, um, the, the New Testament looks a lot more positive, a lot greater than the Old Testament. And people would be tempted to say it's antithetical relationship. And he was saying, no, it's a good, better, a great, greatest. So then he says, putting aside the New Testament and just looking at the Old Testament by itself it has many positive elements that prefigured and anticipated typically the New Testament. Thus, we find that there was real gospel under theocracy. So in a very disconnected type way, people will say the Old Testament is just law. There's no grace. There's no gospel. And he's saying, no, the gospel, there's real gospel in the Old Testament. And Paul actually preaches the gospel from the Old Testament. Um, the people of God of those days did not live and die under an unworkable, unredemptive system of religion that could not have real access to and spiritual contact with God. So this is that this is that concrete foundation that we talked about before. Nor was the gospel element contained exclusively in the revelation that preceded, accompanied, and followed the law. It was found in the law itself. So we saw gospel in first redemptive. We saw gospel in Abrahamic era. And he's saying it's not as if gospel was put on hold. The law came on the scene and there was no gospel. He says there's gospel in the law. And we're going to see that. We're going to see that tonight before we go to the New Testament. It is found in the law itself. That which we call the legal system is shot through with strands of gospel and grace and faith. Especially the ritual law is rich in them. Every sacrifice and every illustration proclaim the principle of grace. Right? It wasn't just a law without a system of restoration. That was the whole sacrificial system. It anticipated failure. There is a way to deal with failure in the law. Okay? So, so this comes back to maybe some of the questions that we demanded perfection. Even in the Mosaic system, um, there was the sacrificial system to provide for. There wasn't that perfect demand. Okay? There was provisional covering of sin to keep their relationship with God. The gospel was preached under the constraint of law and received under the same. It was not permitted, though, to rise superior to the legal environment by which it had been placed. Only the New Testament has brought full liberty in this respect. Hence, we see in James, the law of freedom. So it's, it's, it, it, there is this revelation, there is this, this freedom in, in the law as seen in the New Testament. And, and we, we kind of, Sonny was highlighting the fulfillment in Christ, that only Christ fulfilled this for us. And, and all of us, you know, 
I would hope whether we're dispensational, whether we're covenant, whether we're new covenant, we should say amen to that. And um, at least from 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 my background and 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 a covenantal framework, they would say that a, a, amen to that. Um, there's full liberty in that regard. So everyone should be on the same page there. Okay. So now point number four, I really recommend reading Voss if you haven't read this yet, is he gets into the Decalogue. So he's looked at theocracy generally. Now he's looking at the Decalogue specifically. So he separates and distinguishes the Decalogue from all the other specific applications of the Decalogue. I think that's important for us to see. He says the Decalogue contains no ceremonial commandments. That's interesting. There is, therefore, in a sense, it is... it. It not so much anticipates as condenses and in condensing eliminates and idolizes. Uh, so it makes, uh, uh, it gives like the, the perfect, the, 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 the fundamental necessary components for morality. It joins together the beginning and the end of the entire theocratic movement, the redeeming act of God. And we're going to see this in the Decalogue, in the preamble of the Decalogue. The resultant state of holiness and conformity to the nature and will of God to which the, theocr the theocracy is designed to issue. At the same time, it gives these elements in a form that is adjusted to the practical needs and limitations of the people. So the Decalogue, how can we summarize the Decalogue? Someone summarize for me the Decalogue. Love God love and them. love others. So you can summarize yeah. the Decalogue. Love God, commandments one through four, and love others. Now notice here, that what does anyone remember what's in the preamble to the Decalogue? We're gonna look at that. We're gonna look at that. So here's some here's some general statements before we get into the Decalogue. Number uh, alpha, uh, letter alpha, worldwide application. We must remember that the history of Israel was shaped by God intentionally so as to mirror all important situations befalling the people of God in all subsequent ages. When Jehovah appeals to redemption from Egypt. As a motive for obedience, he appeals to something that is spiritual and uh, has its spiritual analogy in the life of believers. The historical adjustment does not detract from the universal application, but subserves it. So here's what we're going to do. Let's read the Decalogue first, and then we'll come back and continue this so you can really become familiar with the context, okay? Look for eternal truths, unchanging truths. Look for relationship. Uh, look for salvation, okay? So we're looking for for fundamental eternal truths, because he says it's shot through with gospel and grace in the context of law. So let's see if you can find it here, okay? The, God spoke these words saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath yeah. the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast <laughs> love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord, your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord and your God. On it you shall do no work. You or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or your sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore... The Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbors. Voss says it's given in a, in a legal context, in a specific application of Israel, and at the same time, there's eternal truths here, okay? So let's go back to the PowerPoint, but I, I hope that you can can uh, keep that in, 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 the, in the back of your mind, and we're going to come back there again one more time. The law has a religious character and is not founded upon pure imperatives from God. Rather, its preamble brings 
the affection to the Lord, to Jehovah, in view of what he has done redemptively for the people, to bear through a responsive affection upon their conduct. We may apply the term Christian thus retrospectively to the Decalogue. We should say that it contains not general, but Christian ethics. So now there's 10 words that he gives to us. Um, uh, there's 10 words in the Decalogue. We could say 10 words or 10 commandments. And look for that, that reference, 10 words, because Paul will also reference words, this word that you're supposed to obey in, in Romans 13. So, so, so bear that in mind. Uh, word is used in connection with commandments, and it's not infrequently used. And um, we're only, Voss only focuses on the four because he's specifically addressing God's revelation to man and in reference to our relationship with God, okay? So that's why he only addresses the first four words and doesn't have commentary on the last six. That's in Voss, page 149 to 150. All right, so what I want to do now is let's look at those eternal and those eternal truths that are present in the Decalogue, and then we'll finish this PowerPoint and move on to the, to the um, great Shema, okay? So coming back here, looking briefly at verse number two, the question is, is this, oh, let me, let me switch this up here. The question I want to ask us is looking at this Decalogue here, verse number two, is this only temp, is this only dealing uh, in time? We would say temporal or, or eternal or both. Does everyone see the question I'm asking? So is this only a physical relationship, a temporary relationship, or is this eternal or is this both? Is everyone tracking there with what I'm saying? So what, what in verse number two, and we can look at this as well, the rest of the context, what in verse two would tell you whether it's temporal, eternal, or both? I am, I am. Uh, okay, yes, yes, excellent. So we have, we have several here. So we have, we have um, the reference to I am the Lord. Right, so so looking here, this is this is the the I am, and then what else is this not relationship here? Does everyone see that your I am the Lord your God? So it's only temporary, <laughs> only temporal, not, not eternal. Like, do you see what I'm saying? Like, is, is this only a temporary relationship? We, we would have to say, we would have to see that this reference here is, is probably re returning. If they are believing in faith, it's eternal. Does everyone see that? Ask a question if you disagree. I want people to understand. Was it, was it temporal because the your there was referring to uh, Israel? Is that I what think makes... Yeah, yeah so <clears throat> I think they need eternal because even until now, Israel's God is God, right? Yeah, so 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 let's be clear. Someone someone who breaks this and doesn't have uh, doesn't have genuine faith would break these commandments and, and be in hell, correct? So some so so uh, but but the question is so so Sonny brought up the point this is a reference to to Israel, and that is correct. But Israel is both, it's both corporate and individual. Diba? So Israel is a nation, and at the same time, it, there are individuals. So to be practical, okay, so does Moses, is Moses an individual or is it a, a, the nation? Moses is an individual. If Moses says, uh, God is my God, right? He is an Israelite within the context of Israel. Is his relationship with Yahweh, the Lord, just temporary or is it permanent? If he declares, you are my permanent. God, it's permanent. permanent. Does everyone see that? Does everyone see it? it has to be permanent. It's that, that's why Law says, uh, going, we can go back to the PowerPoint. He talks about it being, referring to, to it being beyond. It's, it's more than just in a specific context. Someone who enters into this relationship in faith, it's permanent. Everyone tracking there with me? We looked at last week, we looked at house of slavery. Is this is this just political? 
spiritual. It's spiritual and political, diba? Uh, remember we talked about the slavery being in uh, uh, bondage to sí. sin and also to the gods, right? To, 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 sí, to the gods of Egypt. Idolatry. Sí, idolatry. Yeah. So you have at least, this is the preamble, you have at least one, two, three. Now, in this case, the house of slavery, it's both. Does everyone see that? It's both. It's in the context, but in trusting in Yahweh, if they have true saving faith in Yahweh, in his promises, it's also eternal. Just like Abraham. The promise was in the context and it was distant. So that when Abraham believes, he's believing in a temporal promise, but it's also eternal. No one, none of us would disagree with that. Okay. So coming here, we have the same. We have eternal mixed with temporal. And that's what law says. It's 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 a contextual law, but it's also more fundamental. It's eternal. All right. Everyone tracking there with me? Now look at the next relationships. <laughs> so look at this here. Uh, you shall have no other gods before me. <laughs> Again, this is this is concerning idolatry, and it's concerning worship, right? This is not just a geopolitical, socio-economic issue. This is this is uh, this is an eternal issue. This is this is a command. Is this command still in effect today? Can we say, can we say, you are not to have any other gods except the Trinitarian God? Still in effect. Yes. It's still in effect. Okay? Everyone sees that? It's still in effect. Number four. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or anything like, or, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the, uh, that is in the water under the earth. Now we would say, well, what's the significance of car like this? That that's in their context. But look at this. <laughs> look at this. This comes back down to worship. You shall not bow down or serve them. Why? <laughs> Reason. I'm a jealous God. I am a jealous God. For those of you that have, has anyone, Jesus, have you had Hebrew yet? Or, or Chalmer, have you had Hebrew yet? Has anyone had Hebrew yet or not yet in, in, in uh, CGST? Sadi, have you no. had Hebrew yet? Hebrew one. No one, okay. Yeah, Hebrew okay. one. Oh, everyone's had it. You've already had it. Yeah, I'm not conversant. Sorry. Okay, that's, no, that's fine. And we don't, I'm just, this, this, this showing steadfast love, showing steadfast love, What's that? Did, did you guys talk about the word chesed? In, uh, uh, yes, chesed, yes, chesed. That's, uh, so this is like, uh, this is like uh, covenant love? Covenantal love, yes. Sir. And we see this in Abraham. Abraham's covenant. This is not, this is the covenantal love that God has. For his people. So this is not a temporary fickle thing. <laughs> okay. Look here. Those who love me. So this is again not I mean th that is the that is that is de designating relationship. Okay? It's designating relationship. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God. So again we have <laughs> In vain, the Lord will not hold him guiltless. Coming down here to the Sabbath, absolutely the Sabbath is we're, Voss. We're going to discuss this with Voss. So this would be this would be an historic redemptive context. Okay, um, but look at the basis for the command. Is the basis for the command what's it rooted in? Is it just rooted in the Mosaic Law? No, it's rooted in God's creation.
Does everyone see that? So it's beyond, Voss is gonna talk about this. We're gonna read Voss. It's, uh, it's, it's rooted in God's creative act. Is the Noahic blessing still in effect? Anyone, is, is the Mosaic blessing still in effect? Covenant, still in effect, yes or no and why? Still in effect because it was given, the blessing, the blessing given to Abraham, it was through his faith. And, and those who are, those who has faith, still faith in Christ, it's still, it's being brought to us. Also. Yeah, so Abraham's covenant is still in effect. But yes. I'm I'm saying the the Noahic the Noahic Henry the Noahic covenant is that still in effect? No, co yes. God's covenant with Noah. Yeah. What what can we look at every day and say it's still in effect? What what, what is the sign of the covenant? The rainbow. The rainbow. <laughs> as long as you see, as long as you see the rainbow, the rainbow. Yeah, as long as you see the rainbow, it's still in effect. So here we have this Sabbath, which is a contextual. So it's in a context. All right, so uh, this can, the, the, but the principle, the, is, 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 is the principle still in effect here? So we're going to look at that in, in, in a minute, okay? We can at least say that uh, as long as God, as long as creation exists and God bless and commands rest, Paul says the type is still in effect in some way. Though, though not the explicit command for the Sabbath, the Sabbath day. So we're going to look at that. Voss is going to explain that. And if we accept the biblical framework, the biblical theological framework, and we accept this down here, we have to, because God's creation is still in, existent, in existence, okay? All right. Uh, any other comments or questions? I, I hope that you can see we could continue on to the other commands. But what you're seeing is... What Voss is claiming is that in the Decalogue, it's condensing, it's bringing in, and at the same time, it's in a context, but there is eternal truths in it. And, those, and so, and so if, it's, if, 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 the, if the foundation and the substance of the Decalogue are these eternal truths, then just in the original context, it makes sense that it would still be in effect. And then we go to the New Testament to see to confirm or to deny. Okay, is everyone tracking there with me? Is everyone tracking there with me? So I I don't think this is disputed. I think this is pretty this is pretty this is pretty fair and, and, and reasonable. Okay, so let's go ahead. Let's let's read. Let's read what Voss says, and then we're gonna go back and and then look at the our New Testament. So where are we at here? All right, first word. What does Voss say about the first word? You shall have no other gods before me. To say there are no other gods in existence, therefore you are shut up to serve me alone, motivates the allegiance of Israel to Jehovah less worthily than to say as the Decalogue actually does. I am the Lord, thy God, who has brought you up out of the house of Egypt, out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Besides the appeal to the sense of gratitude for the deliverance received, there shines through also an allusion to the offended honor of Jehovah in cases of other objects of worship should be placed by his side. So this is an issue of anything. So, so in our context, we have other forms of gods. Diba? We don't have carved images, but we have other forms of God, other things that steal our, our affection. All right, and so it's in this context in which the command is given. That's Voss, page 151. The second word, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness in heaven above, earth beneath, the water below them, you shall not bow down or serve them. And so Voss says, this is a major point here. While not easily described in its true inwardness, we may perhaps divine it, define it by a subsumption under the category of magic. Okay, so this is going to get to a little bit of poking here in a Philippine context. Um, magic is, and we have this in the U.S. too. So magic is the paganistic reversal of the process of religion in which man, instead of letting himself be used by God, right, so instead of man being, man being the servant and God being the God and submitting to his will, drags down his God to his level and makes him a tool. 
which he uses for his own selfish purpose. Magic is full of superstition and after a fashion full of quasi-supernatural, but, but is void of true religion because it lacks the element of divine objective self-communication from above. It needs to create for itself material means and compulsion that will bring the deity to do its bidding. So the second command addresses trying to create things to force, uh, to use those things as a way of getting what you want. You, you've, you've essentially made the God your servant. Does everyone see that? So you see that in today's context. Like a genie. Like, like a genie. Diba, how, how in Philippine context do, do they make it like a genie? How is this in Philippine context? What do you have? You always keep asking God for blessing. Okay. <laughs> what is that? I heard someone else. Black Jesus, right? Is it there the Black Nazarene in, in Manila? Is that Black Nazarene? If you just touch yes. it, you're going to be healed. It's literally an issue of, of the idol. The, the, the image is literally your tool to your own purpose. Pina Francia. Santo Nino. Santo Nino. Senor Santo Nino. There you go. So just thinking, okay, whether or not the law is abrogated, whether this is done away with, I mean, it, it fits. <laughs> We're doing the same crap. We're doing the same crap, okay? So humanity hasn't changed. It's, this, this law seems to fit very nicely in 21st century America and any, any context, right? The transition from the second to the third word is a natural one, for here we still have the sphere of magic. This time it's word magic. This is Ray. Ray, you had brought this up before. I missed it. I didn't know. And so here we go. This is what you were talking about before. It's not sufficient to think of swearing and blaspheming in the for us in our common sense. So we think of like using, uh, th this would have application as well, but we're thinking about just like the way we just use it vainly, okay? But that's not what this is referring to here. In the ancient world, the, the word is one of chief powers of, make, of pagan superstition. The most potent form of word magic is name magic. It was believed that through the pronouncing of the name of some supernatural entity, this can compel, the, the, the entity would be compelled to do the bidding of the magic user. So that's what, Ray, you were saying before, Diba, about the, the name was hidden so they could not use his name, like, you know, for... Their own yes, purposes. Yes, yeah, yes. that's that's. There you go. Uh, we must remember that originally the habit of swearing served a far more realistic purpose than at present. If it has become conventional and therefore, as it would pretend, innocent, this is largely because the modern man has retained such a small amount of religion as to make him feel that swearing cannot, at the bottom, be irreligious. <laughs> so we're so we're so off kilter. In ages not so very long ago, I apologize for the typos. In ages not so very long ago, the employment of supernatural names for the purpose of extrication and objurgation had a quite realistic intent. The name serves to call out the, super, the supernatural powers for injuring the enemy or for miraculously attesting the truth of a statement. So you'd swear the name to validate your statement, whether it was true or not. Okay. So it's in this context that the command was given. And so we see this application in our day, all right? So again, has these commands been abrogated, meaning it's no longer a command, right? So for example, sacrificing to, to keep a relationship with God is no longer, right? So I don't go out and sacrifice. It's not binding for me to do, okay? But I cannot... I can't go out and swear. God, I can't go out and swear because I'm still bound to keep this command. This doesn't even talk about whether or not Jesus has fulfilled it for us. Of course, Jesus has to fulfill it for us for us to be in right standing. But that, that's beside the point. Is the command still in effect for all of us to practice? And so, so this is going to get to issues in Romans two. This is going to get to issues in Romans eight. In 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 uh um in Ephesians in in James, are the commands still for us to practice? Putting aside whether we do it or not, are we still bound? So on the last day, whether we are in Christ or not, we are asked: Did we 
fulfill these commands. These commands are still for us to keep. That's the root of the question. That's the root of the question. Fourth word, fourth word. So this brings some clarification to the Sabbath, and then we're going to get into the text. We're moving here. We'll at least be able to start our debate. We'll be able to finish it next week. The fourth word has reference to the, hollow, the hallowing of the seventh day of the week. This duty is based on in Exodus and not something done to Israel in particular, but on something done in the creation of the world. So this reasoning is beyond the, the original context of the Exodus. This is concerning creation. So just looking at the Sabbath, it's, you know, the command is in the context of, of, of Moses, but it's beyond the Israelites. Does everyone see that? It's beyond the Israelites. This is important because it stands or falls the general validity of the commandment for all mankind. So is this commandment valid for all of mankind? Not in the specific context, but in the general sense. Everyone sees that? The principle underlying the Sabbath is formulated in the Decalogue itself. It consists in this, that man must copy God in his course of life. The divine work completed itself in six days, whereupon the seventh day followed as a day of rest for God. So in the specific context of Israel, it was because they were to mimic God who did his creative work in six days and then rested. Okay, so it's beyond the, 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 the Israel context, although they're commanded to keep it in their specific context. Rest resembles the word peace. In this respect, it, it has in scripture a positive, not negative import. It stands for, so peace stands for, rest stands for, the consummation of work accomplished and the joy and satisfaction attendant upon it. So we're getting somewhere. We're getting somewhere. So watch this. The Sabbath brings this principle of the eschatological structure of history to bear upon the mind of man after a symbolic and typical fashion. It teaches its lesson through rhythmical succession of six days of labor and one ensuing day of rest in each successive week. Man is reminded in this way that life is not aimless existence, but there is a goal beyond. What is that goal? Watch this. This was true before and apart from redemption. Viva! In pre-redemptive revelation, man was given a task and he was offered eternal life. So Voss says the eschatological is an older strand of revelation than the soteric. Eschatology is precedes soteriology or salvation. The so-called covenant of works was nothing but an embodiment of the uh, sab sabbatic principle. Okay. I really apologize for these typos. I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta tighten the ship there. Okay. Because we're going towards the principle of rest and completion of our work. God worked and he rested. He gave man a task and the, the, the promise was life. The promise was rest and life in, uh, in fellowship with God. He failed. And so then this, the, 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 the soteric, the salvation was then promised. And so we're looking for whose work? <laughs> whose work are we looking for? Um, okay, so this is a practical point here. Okay, so I, this is a side before we get to whose work we're looking for. Uh, so this is a practical point. The Sabbath is not in the first place a means of advancing religion. <laughs> it, it has its main point, uh, sig its main significance apart from that and pointing forward to the eternal issues of life and history. Okay, so Sabbath deals with our rest and peace in God. Okay, so it so this is the point for for the pastor for the leader is it is a serious question whether the modern church has too much lost sight of this by making the all day well nigh exclusive and an instrument of religious propaganda <laughs> at the expense of eternity typifying value. You should write this quote down, brothers, sisters. Our rest days have become days of insane work. Insane work. That's not to say that we should not have a time of reflection and, and worship, absolutely not. But our, our, our Lord's days 
have have just been we're working harder on that day than the rest of the week brothers <laughs> sisters yeah for the oh, pastors it becomes uh no a gray area because they're supposed to rest of the day but they're working hard to come yeah. up with a preaching but even in the worship you can have one worship service but when you have all these programs all day you com we've completely lost the purpose of the day of worship and rest in christ we've completely lost it we've lost like the whole point of the lord's day is to worship reflect to give it back to god and to rest and we've just lost it so here's the historic redemptive point so this is where we're getting to here this is where we're getting to here the universal Sabbath law received a modified significance under the covenant of grace, whether you agree with it or not. The work which issues into the rest can no longer be man's work. It's not man's work. It becomes the work of Christ. Man, man failed in the garden. And so now we're waiting in the covenant of grace through the promise to the seed, uh, the promise of the seed of the woman. We are waiting for a man to come to complete that work. It becomes the work of Christ. This, this, the Old Testament, New Testament have in common, but they differ in perspective in which they see the emergence of work and rest. And as much as the Old Covenant was still looking forward to the performance of the Messianic work, naturally the days of labor to come, uh, the, the days of labor come first because you're anticipating the work of Christ. The new day rests at the end of the week. We under the new covenant, we're in the new covenant. Brothers, look back. We're looking back at the accomplished work of Christ. We, therefore, must celebrate the rest principle procured by Christ through the Sabbath. Also still remains a sign. Uh, uh, although the Sabbath also still remains a sign to look forward to in the final eschatological rest. So, so we recognize that it's fulfilled eschatologically in the new heavens and the new earth. We're still looking back and applying that Sabbath principle. As long as creation exists on this side of eternity, we have to practice the principle of rest. Because God set it up for us. And you could say, well, no, no it's fulfilled in Christ. It is fulfilled in Christ. We're, 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 we're celebrating it. But if you don't rest... You don't rest. You're part of that creation, and God will take that rest through your through your health, sickness, or death. <laughs> so as long as you're God's creation on this side of eternity, we still have to be practicing that rest principle because that's how physically we have been made to rest. And if we don't rest, eventually we get sick and we have to rest or we die. <laughs> No one can work 24-7 without rest. Even if you don't want to take a, a Sunday Sabbath, you're going to be resting <laughs> in the hospital <laughs> with a heart attack. So, you know, just physically speaking, putting aside the biblical theological framework, putting aside everything else, no, everyone, has to, everyone has to exemplify it or else you'll die. It's impossible. So the Old Testament... People of God had to typify their life, uh, their life, the future developments of redemption. So if we accept the biblical theological framework, we don't, we don't rest on the Sabbath. The, the Sabbath is not directly commanded for us because the Sabbath under the old covenant was looking to the work of Christ. And so we rested. We would rest there in that type. Uh, um, Looking in the New Testament, we're looking back at the work of Christ, and so we celebrate it at the first of the week. And that's what the early Christians did. They celebrated the resurrection of Christ. It was huge in the church. It was at the first day of the week. And we know that it was significant because in the New Testament, a secondary uh, uh, evidence is that it's called the Lord's Day. It's called the Lord's Day. So um, uh, we're still practicing the Sabbath principle. We're still practicing as long as we're on this side of eternity. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Let me just read this question, and then we can have discussion. Let's, let's just read this question. So, so Voss's question is, is, is the Sabbath still binding for Christians? Okay. So, in so far as we shall 
say that the element of prescribed sequence, there is a specifically Old Testament feature in the commandment. So there is that temporal aspect in the commandment. We see that. We clearly see that. Um, and so that is no longer binding. In Christ, that's no longer binding. But is the principle, is the Sabbath principle still in effect? And we have to say, yes. Old Testament feature no longer applies to us, but the general principle on which the sequence, both under old and new dispensations, rests has not been changed. Precisely because it remains in force, the sequence required a change when the New Testament arrived. Besides this, there are other pro prohibitions in the law, which by the very fact of their having not been incorporated in the Decalogue are shown not to be universally applicable. So other rest days were not incorporated into the Decalogue, therefore they're no longer binding. It's only within the Decalogue. So there is a distinction that all of covenant theology makes between outside and inside the Decalogue. And this comes to the bigger picture of we're not under the Mosaic covenant as a system. No one says we are, okay? But the Decalogue contains those eternal binding laws that are never done away with. Nor must it be forgotten that the Sabbath was under the Old Testament, an inter integral part of cycles of feasts, which are no longer in force. The type embodied in it was deepened by the sabbatical year and the year of Jubilee. On the Sabbath, man and beast rest. In the sabbatical year, the very soil rests. In the year of Jubilee, the idea of rest is exhibited in its full positive import through restoration of all that was disturbed and lost during sin. From all this, we have been released by the work of Christ. So Christ is fulfilled. I, I you know, Sonny was emphasizing the fulfillment. Of Christ. Yes, everyone agrees with that. Christ fulfilled so much. But the question is, is the command still binding? Do we still need to practice it, though we have Christ's sacrifice to protect us from failure? And the answer is, it's still binding. Where is the basis? Why is it still binding? This is where. From all this, we have been released by the work of Christ, but not from the Sabbath as instituted at creation. So is the Noahic covenant still in effect? Yes. How do we know? Rainbow. Is the, is the promise of the, of the offspring to undo the seed still in effect? Yes. We're waiting to be to escape death. Genesis 3:15. Is the sabbatic principle? Genesis 2, 1 to 4. The rest, yes, it's still God blessed the day, and now it's been transformed because of the work of Christ. So as long as we are on this side of eternity, the Sabbath principle is still in effect, and therefore. Within the, within the Decalogue, that principle we still are commanded to keep. And those who do not keep it eventually suffer the cir circumstances. God will make you rest <laughs> in sickness or death. <laughs> so um, even the principles of letting rest land, so they have crop rotation. They let the, they let the land rest. Do you buy any, any farmer here? Kea. Is Kea here? Where's Kea at? Kea. Did she leave? I'm here, sir. Don't, isn't there yes, prop, yes, prop rotation? Here. You have to rest the land, right? Diba, there's time to let the land rest, correct? Yes, yes. You have to. Yes. You have to. That's why that's why there are times that you don't actually plant anything. So even though those specific year of Jubilee, the 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 sabbatical years are no longer commanded, the principle of rest is still in effect. And if we don't let the land rest, it becomes it becomes destitute, Diba. It's, it's unusable. If you don't let the land rest, it's unusable, Diba. <coughs> Kea? Becomes a seed. Yeah, yes, exactly. It becomes, yes. yeah. Yeah. So this principle is still in effect. I hope we see that. I hope we see that. And the same is true for our bodies. Um, so we need to rest. <laughs> okay. All right. So where are we at here? Um, scriptural basis. So we're going to look at these passages here. And it is getting late. It is 840. So. Uh, these are the passages under debate. So let's go to Mark 12, 28 to 34 first. If we don't finish tonight, we'll continue next week. We're not in a rush. We're here to learn. We're not here to get crushed. Let's go to the text. Mark 12, 28 to 34. So I'll read the text, and then we will look at, at some truths, and we'll discuss this. And 
we'll just we'll see we'll see where it goes okay and what are the scribes came up and yeah go ahead yeah oh i'm sorry i forgot your question sorry go ahead yeah go ahead yeah sorry yeah uh so in 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 that what boss was trying to say is as far as the sequence is concerned, ano ba yan? What's what's the thought of boss? Well, the way I understand it is it 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 does not matter which day anymore, as long as you take a rest. Is that what he means? Well, no. Well, so it, like so, guys, kasi, cause, cause, yeah. the, like the Seventh Day Adventist, they will always insist that it has to be Saturday. Yeah. So so how so, is that in effect in terms of? Yeah. No. Yeah. No. No. That's good. So so what boss would say is that. Be, the, the, now, maybe you don't accept this reasoning, okay? So maybe you don't accept it. Maybe the Seventh-day Adventist would not. He would say that the principle in the fourth command are still binding. The specific context is not. And the reason why the specific context is not is because the old covenant was anticipating the work of Christ. The new covenant looks back at the work of Christ. So that's why under the old covenant, we would rest. We would work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The seventh, sorry, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, seventh day we rest. The old covenant is anticipating the work of Christ. Now, with the coming of Christ in his work, we're looking back. So we rest first. We rest first in Christ. And then we work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So Voss would still say, no, that the, the timing is important, but it's now not Sabbath. It's actually, it's actually Sunday, and so I would imagine his response to the Seventh Day Adventist is, "Why are you not considering the work of Christ? Because you have to read the Old Testament covenant says this, New Covenant I guess it says this too. So we're all we're all there. We have to read it through the lens of Christ. We have to read it through, through the 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 the, the fulfillment, the completion done in Christ. So that's what he would say." So oh, Sunday Sabbath, it's like the relic line. Huh? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sun, Sunday, 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 then the rest day for us. Sunday Sabbath. <laughs> yeah, so, Sunday Sabbath, yeah. And, and, and so, but explicitly, the reason why, again, the explicit basis is that God blessed, he worked and rested. So there's a special day in which we are to rest. And then with the coming of Christ, we rest on the day that we celebrate his resurrection because that's the promise of future eschatological rest and peace. But because we're still this side, we're still part of creation. We're still part of the created order. We still have to practice the rest. Um, and that's just whether it's scripture or not, that's what happens. Our body breaks down. We have to rest or we're in the hospital and then we're dead. Some, some pastors mentioned to me, Pastor Tim, that yeah. you know it does not really matter which day you take a Sabbath as long as you have one day to rest, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so is that is that is that, is that okay? Yeah, I mean, like, so you, yeah. you, you might consider that day Monday your rest day or just or other yeah. days. Yeah. So, so, so would, would would that somehow nullify that the Sunday rest for? What boss is saying? I mean, that would be a gray area. You're still practicing the Sabbath rest principle. You're still getting rest. So I do think, from boss's perspective, he's Presbyterian. He's a traditional covenantal. So he would. That's why he, the practical point. He would really say that no, we need to we need to rest on Sunday. So our worship services should be small. They should not be really stressful. And and you should rest. You sh you should rest on that day. So I have been in some churches where the Sunday worship is is restful. I've been in a lot of churches where it's stressful. <laughs> I see, I see. So I see boss is Christian. So yeah, I see now the the, yeah. the tradition. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Did, did did boss mention about the idea about a Sabbath Sabbath rest being not universally practiced? So that's why it, 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 the the practices of the Israelites cannot be enforced. Something like that. Well, no, he would, he, 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 would say, he would yeah. say that he would say the principle should be enforced because the basis is in creation. As long as creation exists, we need to be practicing the rest principle. So that would be the basis. Uh, may I read? May I read one one 
sentence, I mean, two sentences in was page 159. Okay, go Can ahead. Can you just look at it, probably discuss before we end tonight? Yeah. From all this, we have been released by the work of Christ, but not from the Sabbath as instituted at creation. In this light, we must interpret certain empty statements such as Romans 14, 5, 6, Galatians 14, 11, Colossians 2, 16, 17. Yeah. What, what does it say? Okay, so, to, okay, I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, Perhaps so, this, is, this, is, this is his conclusion, right? Yeah, so what he's saying is, is that in these contexts, Paul is saying that people can't impose rest days upon you. And so he's saying that in Romans 14, 5, Galatians 4, Colossians 2, they're not referring to the sabbatical principle as seen in creation and as seen in the fourth. They're referring to other sab sabbatical. So that's why he made a distinction, uh, Attorney Boboy, between the, what's contained in the Decalogue and then Sabbath and feast days outside of the Decalogue. So there was no doubt in Col Colossians 2, 16 and 17 People saying, no, you have to take these rest days. You have to take these certain feasts. And, and Paul was saying, no, those are all done away with. And so what some people will say, see, all of Sabbath is done away with. And what boss is saying, no, no, no. He's referring to the others, but the, the principle, it's still in creation. It's still in the Decalogue. That's the principle remains. So, so that's, that's, he's saying that we have to read, we have to read Romans 14, Galatians 4 and Colossians 2 in that broader context. So it would be like saying, Duba, we talked last week, Koya Boy, we, we talked about how like we have been freed from the law, but that doesn't mean we're freed. We're now slaves of righteousness. So it's not an ultimate freedom to do whatever. It's, it's freed in the context of the bondage to sin. We're freed in Christ, but Christ is now our Lord. So it's not an ultimate freedom. We have to read it in the larger context. And so he's saying we have to read the Sabbath and, and, and the release from all these different Sabbath and rest feast requirements, we have, to, we have to read that in the context of we still have the Sabbath principle in effect. All these other Sabbaths, though, are not binding. That's what he's saying. In effect, Ray is uh, quite accurate when he says you can choose the day you can call your Sabbath because as long as you observe the principle of Sabbath, it doesn't matter what day. It will not be a correct interpretation. So that 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 could be an interpretation. I would say Voss would disagree with that yeah. because because Voss is looking at the biblical theological framework. So he's saying the day should be Sunday because we're looking the basso on Sunday. We're thinking, oh, we're looking back at we're looking back at the beginning of the week at the work of Christ. So he would not agree with that. But that's a gray. I would say that's a gray area. If if, if you would practice a different day. That would be that would be open interpretation. The fact that we're practicing the principle of rest is what's important. Um, you know, I am much more in line with Paul, so I would say that we should be. So I try to rest on Sunday. I try to take a rest on Sunday from my work. Um, you know, I'm not perfect. I still fall short. Um, sometimes I work. I, I, I'm trying. I'm try. You know, we all fall short. This is this is the this is the grace that we have in Christ. So we need to try to keep. We fall short. We sin. We're not sinless, but but the, the the law is still binding for us to follow. And in Christ, we have escaped from our failure. Uh, just just to end, just to end yeah. this 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 area. So when we say in the in the New Testament context that we follow the principle of Sabbath, to what extent are we? Can we still work? Or can we still do something? To what extent can we do something on Sabbath? Yeah, so so if that's a whole other debate. That's a whole other debate. Um, there's different views on that. My 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 personal uh, conviction is that it should be a break from your typical work week, um, but that doesn't mean like if there was an emergency, right? So so the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So if there was a need for you to do something good, your your neighbor's truck breaks down, you can work. You can help him. Um, but it should be a break from work. So it should be a time of, 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 of worship, reflection on what God has done in Christ, a time with your family, a time of rest. You know, I think that in many ways, someone who like, they'll play sports as a form of rest, you know, 
there's debate. Like in Presbyterians, there's huge debate. You can't do any sports or anything. So, so there, there's a there's a gray area there. But I would definitely say it's a break from your typical stress of the week. Uh, it's really a break from the, the typical stress of your week. However that however that is, yeah. Yeah, the way we break it by going outside and go on vacation. Like going, that to, okay the beach, going yeah. to the going beach, going to the beach, going to the beach, something like yeah, that. Something is like that okay. I, I think that's that 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 is your especially if you're going there and you're reflecting on God's creation. Is that not is that not going and reflecting upon what God has done? You're reflecting on His work, both yeah. in creation and Enjoying in Christ. His so, nature, yeah. creation. No, I think but that's a good application. Right. Yeah, I think that's a good application yeah. of it. Yeah. yeah. So I think we did right the last Sunday. We went to uh, waterfalls and appreciate God's goodness. Yeah, yeah. So I'm safe to say I. I had a Sabbath day on Sunday. Next Sunday, Good. I will be going to a, to a friend hit there in Presbyterian Church because <laughs> it's Sunday. So, so Tim, it, so did, that does mean that we don't need to go to church anymore. We just have to continue to celebrate God's creation then. No. It's, just, <laughs> no. it's, 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 because... it's Sabbath as instituted at creation. But but remember, and, but and hold on. We, but, but, but remember, we're celebrating the work of Christ. So... We celebrate the work of Christ. Um, so actually, we celebrate. We should be celebrating the resurrection, and we should be we should be partaking of the Lord's Supper more often than we typically do, because it's. How it's, about Pastor Tim, the the pastors who preach for services on Sundays? Oh my goodness. <laughs> no comment. No comment. No comment. I have no uh, comment for that. Tim, you have to co- make that's a, a lot of comment work. On that because a lot of pastors, a lot of work already. What can, what is your stand? There's been times where I preached two services. I've never preached. I've I've preached three services once or twice in the sense that I taught Sunday school. I preached morning service and I preached evening service. I've done that only a couple times, and my body was destroyed like i just you know now for me like with teaching i really get into it so maybe a pastor that's very calm i get really excited i have i get really you know you you know me but i could not do it i could not preach every week it would just it would just it would just destroy me um you know i I think i think that it's too much i think that you should be you should have maybe one service I think you should have one service. If your church is big enough to have two services, church plant. <laughs> church plant. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I think I think two to three to four services. That's four churches yeah. now. Yeah. Before yeah, COVID, uh, PBC we have three services. I know yeah, uh, on one, Sunday, one, one, one. and it will, it was the same preacher from morning to afternoon and evening the same preacher. I could yeah, not. So yeah. Hello. Yeah, that's why Pastor Elder is very important in every local church. Yeah, there's must there must be multiple pastors. Yeah. <laughs> I I really I mean this is my, this is my this is my interpretation, but I think that if you're having three services, church plant, church plant talaga, church plant talaga, because even maybe in your service, the about one they're always going to the same time, so you never even met the people in the other services. It's already functioning like two churches. Dubai, you have your small group. So your small group, you meet. And then if you're going at the same time, you literally are meeting your own group. You're, you, you will never meet the others. You know, so I, I think at that point, church plant, I think. And then yeah. you have, yeah, I, I really think that's the solution. So anyway. Yeah, but, 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 yeah. but. It is a gray area. So there are churches that have three services. I, I, yeah, it's a gray area. So it's not like thus says the Lord. I'm not saying thus says the Lord, but yeah, you know, you should be rejuvenated after Sunday, not destroyed. <laughs> you should it's be rejuvenated. To prepare. What was that, Ray? It's not. To prepare us yeah. Okay, it is 855. So we did not get into your passages. So I think let's just cu- let's let's call it tonight and next week we will we will have we will have it. So is everyone okay with that? We can how about this? Because most have not yet submitted. Most have not yet submitted. Okay. Do your assignment. Do the assignment again. And I think we'll 
you have a lot of questions to think about. This is one of the fundamental debates in all of theology. Don't be afraid to change or to modify. In some of those questions, you could answer two, um, although it has to make logical sense. Um, and so uh, let's, let's, let's call it here because it's already nine o'clock and this is a good place to stop. There are, semi, there are several, as you said, it's, uh, this portion is uh, debatable and some would say it was uh, abrogated, but there is one uh, principle that stick. As far as, it, as I said, as far as the moral law is concerned, it is still binding. Yeah. But as far as the ceremonial law was concerned, that is already abrogated. Can that be a good summary of the, of the effect or abrogation of the law? The mosaic law. I, I would want to say. Can, can, I, it be, I, can it be a better? I would. I would use the word fulfill, because and well, maybe I, I'll use the word fulfill because I don't like the word abrogated. And we'll you'll. So, let's add, add that question. Why should we hesitate from using the word abrogate? Look at the passage of scripture closely, and and we can. I think we can see a reason why we don't want to use the word abrogate. Um, it's in it's in one of the passages there. So so look through it. You know I've used words wrongly. So again I just want to emphasize no one. You know we we always can go back and change. We modify. You know I've changed my view. So I I don't want us to hold our theology on our sleeve in this area. I want us to grow. I want us to to learn. Let's grow together. So anyone else want to add? Yeah, it's very hard. And so I'm telling you right now, I struggle with Voss's, uh, with Voss's English and reading. So if I'm a first English reader and it's hard, for sure it's hard for you. But I do want to say this. For me with the Sabbath, I went back and forth many times. Okay, so I was on, I was on various sides. Even there was one time where I literally, I thought, no Sabbath. I'm just going to work, 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 work. And that's partly why I would just crash. After two weeks, I would crash. I would get sick. I would just be destroyed. And, and it took several years for God to slap me around and like, no, you need to rest. And so I'm still, I'm a recovering workaholic. I'm a recovering workaholic. So I really want to emphasize that the things that we're, I'm sharing, like, you know, I make mistakes. I have bad interpretations too. So we're, we're all there. So I just really hope this class is, is a class where we can really, I have changed my some of my views through Voss. So literally just changed my views. I've been studying for many years. So no one should be ashamed. No one should feel bad. This, th these are areas that have been debated for centuries. Um, yet I think that when we study clearly and, and closely, there is, an, an, there is an answer. There is an answer. We're, we're all recovering. Uh, we're all recovering. Uh, hope drawing close. By the grace of God. Anyone else want to add? All right, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your grace and for your love for us. Father, we do not deserve your love. We thank you that you have given us the law, that you have given us um, uh, just a picture, and at the same time, you gave us, uh, you revealed your eternal law to us. Father God, we ask for the strength to, to love you with all our heart, mind, and soul, and strength, and to love others as as ourselves at the same time father we are so thankful that we have freedom in christ that christ fulfilled the law for us that even when we fall short we don't face the judgment that is that is declared in your justice because of the work of christ and father at the same time we recognize that that uh, we we need to still obey you we still need to keep your commandments and so Father God, I just pray that all of us would realize this and that we would um, take care, not, not just to, to focus on the big commandments like sharing the gospel, but the small ones like taking rest. Father, sometimes the small ones are so hard to follow. I just pray that we would remember to rest, to rest in your son, um, both spiritually and physically. And Father, we look forward to the consummation of all things when we will rest in your kingdom that our works would follow us and we would just have a great time of fellowship. Um, we, we look forward to that day, Father. So we, we, we say, Maranatha, may your son come soon. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things by faith alone. Amen.